b-boy from the old to the new still a b-boy too bold for the school still a b-boy east coast to the west b-boys worldwide we supposed to be blessed still a b-boy from the old to the new still a b-boy. today's guests and i go way back for decades both of us were on the milwaukee hip-hop scene we were also both part of the super group 1848 You've heard him on dozens of Hunter First songs, one of the most talented lyricists Milwaukee has ever produced. Ladies and gentlemen, Track Blazer. What's up? What up, MCAK? Do you remember the first time you heard hip hop? Um, it was DJ Jazzy Jeff uh, Rock the House. Oh, great song. Yeah, yeah, with 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 Ready Rock C was they right. beatbox. Yeah, when we rock the house, there is no doubt. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. Yep. First hip hop that I ever heard in my life was my aunt Annette. She had the album Run DMC, the mm-hmm. very first album. Right. So I think the first song I ever heard was either Rock Box or. You remember back in the day, every DJ used to have their own song. Mm-hmm. So, so it was either Rockbox or the song Jam Master J. Was e- either one or two of those was the first song mm-hmm. I ever I ever heard. So, man, that came out in what eighty four? Eighty three, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, you know, you know what happened. I think I could be wrong, but. I want to say that they had a buzz in 83 and then a album was officially released 84. I could be wrong. It's possible. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. that era. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Because I know King of Rock came out in 85 because that was the first time I remember hearing hip hop and I, I can remember the, you know, it, it vividly. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's crazy how you say that though, because mm-hmm. in '88 was the first time I spent my money on on rap music. I was mm-hmm. 11 years I was 11 years old in '88, so the first tape I ever bought in my life was Strictly Business. Oof. So Classic, you, you yeah, so you can imagine why my music collection probably ended up being upwards of three thousand, four thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Because you know, if if the first tape you ever buy is strictly business, you basically bought like a five mic, you know, classic all time classic right. album. That's the first, that's the first album you ever bought. Like you, you not you're never gonna feel negative about hip hop, even now. You know, because I mean, it's you know the game is so bad now. You know, you you have to go back to X Clan or PE or stuff like that just to feel to feel anything towards it anymore. But if if that first album that I bought was whack, you know, at forty four years old, I mm-hmm. I wouldn't feel like let me put on some Professor X, you know, to put me in a good mood. You know. Right. So as a kid, who were some of your favorite MCs? You know, your one or two favorite go tos. Oh, it's there, there. There's only three. I mean, and this is this is like without question. So there's only three. Right. So number one is Rakim. Number two is Boogie Down Productions, and mm-hmm. I'll give him that credit because he he was really pushing Boogie Down before he pushed his own name, KRS-One. Right. And then three was Chuck D, and like it in that order. Mm-hmm like that so that's what probably informed the fact that in my own rhymes you probably noticed that i I never cussed or or swore Mm -hmm. it was because rakim didn't cuss right you know and if if the best don't cuss why do i need to cuss you know i didn't even realize until later on that doc did not cuss for the exact same reason and he idolized Rakim, and he said, if the best don't got to cuss, why do I got to cuss? Mm-hmm. Which also makes his first album one of the best to ever be recorded. Because mm-hmm. think about it. Think about it. He came out with N.W.A., did a completely different style, mm-hmm. didn't cuss, and everybody still loved the album. Like, like 
you don't understand the level of mastery of the art form you have to have that that album was not rejected. <laughs> you know what I mean? I totally agree. That's a classic. I've always oh, said yeah. that if DLC wouldn't have lost his voice in that car accident, he may have gone yeah. down as one of the you know best to ever do it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I had the pleasure of meeting him in Milwaukee. And uh, just strangely enough, he told me Giannis is going to be better than Michael Jordan. And I was like, what? <laughs> he was like, I'm, I'm serious, man. Yeah, yeah. He said, he said, y'all might have to get with the mayor and some of y'all politicians and tie him up. And, you know, I hate to say it, maybe threaten his baby mama or something. And, <laughs> Just tell him that he can't leave Milwaukee under no circumstances. He, he and, and he said this before we won the title. So, right. and you know he's originally from Dallas. So it, mm -hmm. so none of what he said to me could have just been on some type of bias because right. he ain't from nowhere near Milwaukee, and he was dead serious. He said, "I think he's going to be better than Michael Jordan." And I said, "Okay, okay, Doc, we ain't going to go that far, man." <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's big shoes to fill. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you're a fan. You're bumping BDP, Chuck D, learning more from them than you probably did in history class in school. When did you start writing yourself and rhyming? I didn't start writing until 1996. And um, I used uh, It Was Written uh, to teach me how to write bars. So the song that uh, I practiced writing bars off of was Black Girl Lost. Okay. Probably one of Nas's more underrated songs. Um, KC was singing on the hook. Right. And um, it was real interesting because he had the girl talking at the start of the song and said, oh, yeah, I got to deal with this Negro again. He's going to start talking about that God body ish. She says, uh, you know, basically mm -hmm. kind of mocking the fact that he tries to be conscious, right. you know. And, uh, and so then ironically, he's rapping about the same type of girl that's mocking somebody that's trying to be conscious, you know, because we had this thing today where if you're trying to get a female on the right track, uh, what's the word that they use? AK, okay, they, they call it trying to save the chick or caping for a chick. Right, right. And, and stuff like that. But that's why I always respected Nas is because uh, he'll throw random things inside of, the, of a song like I can't remember the name of the song but he says uh old-fashioned I don't think men should wear earrings and then just uh just kept rapping about something else uh -huh. you know what man. I'm saying yeah yeah he got a song called purple haze off the lost tapes uh the whole city is mine blah 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 I don't like how Diddy did shine with different lawyers and then just just started rapping about something else yeah. I think the I think the literary term is called non sequitur or something like that, mm -hmm. or or uh, it's non sequitur. Or there's another uh, there's another term for it when you can just spit poetry in a way that you're talking about different things that are on your mind, and it doesn't have to be linear. That okay, I'm talking about MCAK moving to Orlando. And that's all I'm talking about for 16 bars. Mm -hmm. Like I, I can bounce everywhere I want to go and then still come back to you moving to Orlando. And that's why like Nas is so talented, you know, that you could, I mean, the, the argument be between him and Jay-Z is a really tough one, you mm -hmm. know, but I'm starting to feel like Nas is passing up Jay-Z just off the fact just the work ethic, the fact that he just released a surprise album on Christmas Eve. Right. And, and this surprise album is just as good as the one that he did with, uh, what is it, King's Disease Part 2? Right, yep. Like, like this album is just as good as that one. And the man is like 47, 48 years old at this point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, and I don't think, Jay has released anything since uh, the the Carters, the joint album with ba with 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 Beyonce. I think that's the last project he released. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, I kind of went way off track with that. But yeah, I uh, I basically my my partner Dre Love has started telling me even before I, I want to say it was before he heard me rap. 
I think because he knew how much I like rap and how knowledgeable I was, mm-hmm. that he wanted he wanted to start getting me on some songs. And I'm like, what? And I said, I don't even know how to write bars, you know. And then he didn't tell me listen to songs to start doing. I started practicing, and then the person who is a hundred percent responsible for me rapping was uh a gibbs aka adrian aka fat daddy mm-hmm. boom aka super 304 he said that there was a guy in the hood on atkinson who had a studio and only charged 20 dollars per song to record songs right. and he wanted he wanted me to start making songs and once again this is somebody that's never heard me rap that says i want you to start making songs so you know how it is okay ak it's kind of weird <laughs> people that know you that have never heard you do something before just decide for you that you can do it right <laughs> you know it kind of reminds it kind of reminds me of that joke that the fresh prince had he said that they had all these meetings they were clapping and high-fiving and celebrating they they sealed the deal for the fresh prince show mm-hmm. he said and after they got up from the meetings he said nobody asked me if i could act <laughs> right <laughs> you know and, and that was the same thing i got two different people telling me yeah I, I want you to start writing raps and then another person says i want you to come to the studio record songs and 1997 is the first time that i recorded a song so am i before you or did you uh record 90, after me for the- no 96 i released my first album so was that also the same year that you ever recorded the song yeah no that wasn't the first time i recorded a song i was recording stuff in like 93 94 okay, okay. i wasn't so putting then, it out okay so then you you probably realized the uh the milwaukee famous and i'd say somewhat world famous baby drew from milwaukee absolutely yeah yeah so he was one of my big influences because him and my friend deep note aka Eric Derrick yeah yeah they were the first two people I ever heard rapping on a song on tape so before I so so keep in mind so it took me four years before I did what they did but I was in awe of the fact that that Derek note you know my boy D note was mm-hmm. 15 15 years old and had a song called trip to the mill where he sampled Compton's Most Wanted. And I just couldn't believe how he sounded on there. And then um, Baby Drew's best friend was a guy we called Bucko Five. Um, his name was Eric. And they had, what was it? They had seven songs. And those seven songs were like the most popular songs in Milwaukee. And those songs were incredible. And, and me and my guys listen to them all the time. And then, ironically, the same year I started recording is when Bucko Five got shot and killed. And so then Derek Note replaced him as the group The Country Boy clicked. Mm-hmm. But yep. the, the original Country Boys was Baby Drew and Eric. So I can't tell you that KRS One, Chuck D, and Rakim were the ones that influenced me without saying that guys from around my way and around my hood were actually doing it at 15, 16, 17 years old. Mm-hmm. And I and I didn't start until I was 20. You know, right. but to be honest, I probably wouldn't have had the confidence to think that I could even do it had it not been for baby Drew, Eric, and 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 D Note. Mm-hmm. So I think the first time I heard you was the Capital Drive album. Yeah. That came out 99 ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ni- yeah, 1999. Um, I'll tell you something crazy about that. I never used to understand Nas. Nas used to get kind of angry about Illmatic. He seemed kind of bitter about Illmatic. The the thing that Nas used to complain about Illmatic so much is he used to say that people wouldn't let him get past it. And as an artist, you always want to want to grow. But if people think that's your greatest work, sometimes when they praise you for it, in a way, they're kind of saying, either I don't think that you can do something better than this, or even if you can, I don't want to let go of this. Mm-hmm. And, and to be honest with you, 
technically Capital Drive is the only solo album I ever released because basically towards the end of, of my little run, I did a mixtape album called Beverly Hills 53209. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but it took me a while to put that out. And by the time I was able to finally get it out, uh, my my era was done. It was like I had so so many records. I had so much influence. But by that time, people were done with CDs. So even people who really supported me was like, well, no, nah, man, no, nah, track. I can't get it if it's on a CD. I don't got a CD player no more. Mm -hmm. and and it was just over and I couldn't believe it so and then plus I only had a couple of original songs on there most of them was over like industry beats but technically as you know the rest of my projects were with you mm -hmm. and and with Boo so technically Capital Drive is the only solo album I ever released but that's the one that people loved and that's the one that some people they just never talk about any of my other stuff even though i'm sure you probably feel the last project you were released that's probably when you felt that your skills and your writing and song choices and sequencing allow me to speak for you correct did you feel like the last project you released was your best one that's how i usually feel nine times out of ten right um, and i think yeah. i think as artists we always feel like that because Rapping is the only thing like, okay, I'm not as a good of a basketball player as I used to be. Right. Like, I'm still pretty good for 44 years old, but I'm nowhere near as good as I used to be. But rapping hip hop is very weird in the sense that I think that lyrically and even song concepts, everything delivery at 44 years old, I think I'm killing the 22 year old version mm -hmm. of me from Capital Drive. But just with life circumstances and stuff like that, it's like you can't get bitter if people just claim that you have a classic and they love one project. But I will say that that is, I, I can kind of understand where Nas was coming from. People don't really embrace him fully beyond Illmatic you know, because artists don't like to feel like that they can't grow. So in 99, when, when that came, or when I stumbled upon it, was when Slang and I were doing the first rearranged album. And I had a mission to just search out every a local artist I could find. You know, I was, if it was a local artist, I, I was buying the city, I was buying the tape, I was trying to, because I wanted to have as much knowledge about the scene as possible. Yeah, but I, yeah. I think the first time I reached out to you was after I heard um, the Ghetto Centric, which was a few okay. years after that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We put that out in 02. So that was like right. three years later. That's about right. Because the second rearranged album would have just been out. And I was working on Kane's album. And that's the first time I uh, got with you and Boo. And we did tracks. Yeah. And a few years later, that morphed into 1848, which. Oh, yeah. Um, I still, I look back very fondly on that. I really think we're, it was amazing. Everyone had their own styles, but it all fit together. That was an amazing group. Um, hey, 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 so, so, so I don't think that people really understand that I'm listening. Maybe, uh, I know you interview East Sham, maybe mm -hmm. East Sham could understand. People don't really understand how difficult it is to be a local independent artist that doesn't have a manager that's funneling funds to mm -hmm. you for what you do. If you work a job and you do hip hop on the side and you pay for all your own hip hop, people have no idea how frustrating and how much energy that it can zap from you. Yeah. So I say that to say, I think at some point when we were trying to do fast forward, I think everybody was just tired, man. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think that's why I didn't come out. I think, you know, I think Kevin, I, that might have been around the time that he had a baby for the first time. And it isn't that, you know, you don't like each other and you don't want to see yourself be successful. It's just that when you are trying to do it on your own and you don't have anybody pushing you, it just really drains you every time you do a project that you're the one putting everything into the project just to make it come out. 
And then once it comes out, you have to be the one to keep the buzz up and mm-hmm. perform. And because I was I was gonna ask if you remember how come we didn't do it, but I remember I think we finished the album, and I think that the 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 artwork in the name in the title of the album I came up with, it would have been so much colder than the first mm-hmm. one. Because remember, remember I said we should call it fast forward. Yeah. <laughs> and then I said all of us should be on the cover looking like the Matrix with the uh with the suits and the sun. Right, right. <laughs> And then have like the the green and black, like the matrix. What do you call it? The computer lines in the background. Right. Yeah. The, Dude, the matrix. That, that would have been an incredible album cover, and 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 I do think, I just think just that dope of an album cover, and then like just upgraded production and lyrics. Mm-hmm. I think that would have caught on more than the first album, but. It's just one of those weird things, just like how Dre, you know, not to put us in the same breath as Dre, but um, it's just weird that we never officially put that out, you know? It, it is, because there was a lot of good songs we recorded. It is a shame, but going back to the, the formation of 1848 and that first album, I don't even know if at the time, and you could speak for yourself, but at the time, I truly appreciated what a great group we all had on one project. I mean, I, I don't remember my my exact thoughts, but looking back at it now, you know, we really brought a lot of people together with one mission. You know, we did a lot of great shows off of that record. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the time, you're in the weeds, and you don't you don't really see much, and you're just living in the moment. So I kind of appreciate it even more looking back now in my mid forties than I did when I was living it in my twenties. Well, well, I think I think uh, hold, hold your thought. I don't want you to miss you. No, no. Yeah, I don't want you to uh, lose your thought. I think that 1848 represented that we tried to do something that everybody just bumped their gums and just gave lip service to. Everybody saying that uh, we should try to unite. Mm-hmm. So you basically talking about three different record labels, right? All came together. Well, four if you can consider Slang had his own label. He too, did right? at the time, right? Yeah. Okay, so four different record labels came together for, and even if you uh, include Double C, for Mm -hmm. a group of, with Double C was six people, then I think without Double C went to five people, right? It was seven Uh, with um, with Double C, C, yep. Okay, yeah. So six people in four record labels all trying to come together for a project that represented the whole state. Mm-hmm. Like, like that's that's not lip service. That's trying to pull resources instead of everybody in every little city trying to be number one in a city right. and trying to get a record deal off of that mentality. You know what I'm saying? So, but I think the reason that it still doesn't work is because you know being a local MC is kind of a disease. Like it's it's just so many people trying to do the same thing. And then nobody stops to look and think about the fact that once Mike Jones got signed, Chameleon Air got signed, then Slim Thug got signed. And then I want to say Trey the Truth got signed, Zero got signed. It was like once Houston decided that they was going to be somewhat unified, then the industry said, okay, give me this person, give me this Mm -hmm. person, give me this person. And... um, Atlanta, you know, down here definitely did the same thing, but there was none of that going on in Chicago, none of that going on in Milwaukee, and St. Louis had it a little bit, but I will be honest with you and say that Nelly kind of hated a little bit, and Nelly really wanted to be the only one. Just some of the stuff that happened with Chingy, some of the stuff that happened with Murphy Lee. Right. Some, you know, it, it's cool for Nelly to say I put St. Louis on, but part of him, part of him felt threatened by how much talent the city really had, and he mm-hmm. really felt insecure that somebody would knock him out of his spot. But that's not supposed to be your your focus. You know, your your focus. You know, St. Louis has three hundred thousand people within the city limits, a million people. Uh, the metropolitan population. 
you're not gonna go platinum off the metropolitan population of that right. one city in Missouri. You go platinum because 20,000 people in about a hundred different cities buy your album, <laughs> you know? So just looking back on it, I think it was very uh, progressive, you know, that we tried, well, I can't even say we tried to come together. We did, we did it. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yep. And, and we put the, the record labels aside, you know, we put the, the geographic boundaries aside, you know, that was, that was the, really the whole concept of 1848 is because I really realized that there was some white dudes that was not from the hood <laughs> a, across the state of Wisconsin that could actually rap. And, and, and they were in Oshkosh, Stevens Point, Appleton, mm -hmm. Jane, Janesville. It was really weird to me. And that's how I ended up for a brief time doing the thing called Big Ten Radio because uh, I was trying to shine light on artists besides Milwaukee, right? you know, and, and the majority of them were Caucasian. But then a lot of people reached out to me because then what about the black people who were in Appleton mm -hmm. <laughs> and, the, and the black dudes that were living in lacrosse that actually rapped? You know, it, it, it kind of gave them a voice. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I never understood, you know, a lot of people, you kind of touched on it, want to be the star so they don't like working with other people i always thought i loved collaborating because i always thought that brought the best out of me if i hear you or slang or someone lay a dope verse my first thought is you know i can't do something whack so i always thought it upped my game and made me a better mc in the in the end of it all i, I think i think your best verse was made a yeah, that's a good verse. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 at least in, in the sense of, uh, of it seemed like that you were having fun. And mm -hmm. just like you said, I really got the impression on listening to that verse that you were le listening to everybody else verse and say, oh, no, hell no. <laughs> like, right. like it felt like you saying, no, hell no. Like, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming on this. And, um, yeah, that that it, it's just real cool when uh kind of similar to, to Wu Tang, you probably have heard the story. And let me know if you've ever heard the story before. Do do you consider uh abomatomically uh Socrates philosophies and hypotheses can't define how I be dropping these? Do you consider that one of the best verses of all time? Of Inspect the deck of Inspect any the Wu, deck. of any Wu member or just in general. People, believe it or not, AK, people consider that one of the best verses, period, of all time. Mm -hmm. Inspector Deck Triumph, the opening right. verse. Do, do you hold that verse up there that high? Well, it's a dope verse. I don't know if I, I'd put it as one of the best I ever heard. That That's tough to say off the top of my head, but there's no okay, doubt okay. he was up in his game. Well, okay, well, I just say that to say this. Uh, RZA basically had a system that obviously with nine people in Wu-Tang, you cannot always get all of them on one song. Right. And so the legend is Wu uh, Rizzo told Inspector Deck that his verse was trash and said, if you don't write another verse and spit it before everyone else is done, you're not making the song. And, and they said that a couple Wu-Tang members had to hold him back because Inspector Deck started crying and was oh, trying to and was trying to swing on Rizzo yeah. that he was so hurt that he said that. And the legend has it is that's what he came back with when Rizzo pissed him off mm -hmm. and said that the verse was trash. So, like, uh, like being in the group or in any other setting that I've ever been in, whenever. You know, I think I might have the best verse, but I think one or two people edge me. Mm -hmm. I always go back to inspect the deck like, man, something fired them up or something pissed them off. It, it might have not been something that happened in the studio in that room, but something, you know, within them said, I got to have the best verse on this song. Talking about 1848, I wanted to bring up Ted Ju. You know, he's yeah. no longer with us. Um, yeah. Just kind of, you know, reminisce about Ted Ju, you know, what do you think of when you hear Ted Ju? Uh, just, you know, any stories that stick out to you? 
Um, probably, probably one of my best ones is I had a, uh, I had flew in a couple of my boys that I went to college with in Atlanta. I flew them into Milwaukee to come kick it with me for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. And neither one of them had ever been here. And I'm sitting up there in the food court at Mayfair. <laughs> I'm sitting there in the food court at Mayfair with one of my boys that I went to Clark Atlanta University with. And, you know, Teju came over and gave him that. Man, Teju did not care that me and him were sitting up there eating. He was just smiling and talking for like 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's him. <laughs> and, and and my boy was like, bro, what was that? I was like, man, I was like, I was like, that was my partner, man. I was like, you know, it, it, it's like, it's like Tej you ain't gonna stop in, until he ready to stop. You know, mm -hmm. it's like like he don't he don't look at it like he interrupting something, man. Right. He 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 saw his boy and he wanted to catch up, you know. But it just made me laugh because um because <laughs> it's just so perfectly him and then the other thing that was funny and and boo boo brought it up is that sometimes with his rap style you couldn't understand what he was saying right right because it because it was so unorthodox it's and i so think unique. we do yeah yeah i think we was doing a show somewhere and you know how like when we say our verses and then you know like we kind of chime in on the on the ad libs you right, know, right. because we know each other's verse. Mm -hmm. He said, <laughs> Boo, Boo told me that Teju turned around and yelled at, at Boo, like, man, you're supposed to be coming in uh with my backups. And Boo looked at me and said, like, dude, how am I supposed to come in? I don't know what Teju talking about. <laughs> <laughs> But but he he was a, he was a genius in that way, kind of similar to Ghostface because Ghostface also has a way of like like what the hell are you talking about? Mm -hmm. But but what makes Ghostface so appealing is he seems like he's enjoying it, even though you don't a hundred percent understand what he's talking about. He's enjoying it, and it's just infectious that he's enjoying what he's saying. And I, I definitely felt uh, Teju was the same uh, way. And uh, probably my favorite verse on him is, uh, is, is Sunday Afternoon, because I don't know what it was about that song, but Teju just loved that song. Mm -hmm. And if you, uh, if you go back and listen to just his verse, because wasn't he the opening, uh, the opening verse on that song? I don't remember. I'd be lying if I said he I was. don't remember. He, he could have been no man. Uh Sunday afternoon in the home with a the mill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think he was. He was. He, he, was. Yeah. he, he loved that song. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and so even though that was a group song, it it really felt like Teju like featuring the rest of us. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Because right. it just and then I think uh the homegirl who sang Candy, Candy. that was his homegirl, yep. right? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. So that was a hundred percent. I'm even starting to think maybe that was his song idea, if if I'm not mistaken. It could be. It could be. Yeah, 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 yeah. What I loved most about Teju and uh, was he'd get into the booth, and sometimes he would spit an eleven bar verse. Sometimes he might spit a twenty eight and a half bar verse. You never knew what you were getting. But there was once that. He was way short, and Jesse's looking at me like, "What? Should we tell him to keep rapping?" So I go to Teju. You know, he still got eight bars left. He goes, "But I'm done. That's all I want to say." I'm like, "All right, <laughs> you know, I'm done. That's what I got to say." Yeah. But one of the most genuinely nice people I probably ever met. I mean, I can't think of something bad to say about him. Yeah, man. I, uh, even even he he messed the movie up. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, being in a hood by uh, Boo's house. Yeah, yeah, Miller. I remember that. But yeah. but but Tage, you messed the movie up because the movie was supposed to be hood, and once again he's just on camera smiling, <laughs> like right. like even even when he's saying a line, and I think and I think we had like prop guns at one point, right? And he and he got the prop gun in his hand smiling. 
And it was like, like, like they too, like, like this is supposed to be intimidating. Like you can't be smiling, dude. You know what I'm saying? But like I said, he he just he couldn't be anything other than himself. You know what I'm saying? So he he was just he was just a happy dude, you know. And uh, also brought up Jesse, another person who, who we lost late, uh, not too long ago. Also, at the time, you know, he was my only engineer from 99 on. You know, I, I don't know if I truly appreciated how big of a party was of all the music I made. But I can't imagine now working with a different engineer because after 20 years of working with him, he knows my levels. He knows exactly yeah, how yeah, I'm yeah. Um, He was a bigger part of you know, what we all did than I think I realized at the time. But now, again, I look back on it, and he really was an integral part of the the whole thing. Any funny Jesse stories? I I, I, I guess the young Twan story is is, is crazy because, uh, (laughs) see, he knows everybody's business because he recorded so many of us, you know what I mean? And my personal thing is I I want to say that he overheard that Twan might have took one of the computers from the studio mm-hmm. because he because he didn't strike me as the type that would just lie. But also me knowing young Twan as as well as I do, I know that he wouldn't steal a computer from there. Right. But it somehow got back to Tony Neal. And <laughs> I was recording with Jesse and I was taking a break. And Young Twan parked his car across the street. If you remember, it used to be a pick and save there. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> just the fact that he parked his car across the street at, at pick and save and was coming across the street in my direction, I said, oh, this this cannot be good. Right. And so he went past me. I was like, what's up, Twan? And he just ignored me. Like, like I could see fire through his shades. Mm-hmm. And he told Jesse, he said, you lied on me. Now I need you to put your hands up, boss. He was like, uh, he was like, Twan, I'm not going to fight you. And uh, he put Tony Neal on the phone. And Tony Neal, I guess, called. Oh, Tony Neal tried to tell young Twan, yeah, if you do anything to uh, Jesse, I'm never going to play your records again. And he <laughs> said, Tony, please. He said, you don't even play our records. He said, how dare you try to threaten me with something when you don't even, you don't even support the local scene? He, he said, I'll deal with you later and hung up on him. He said, now, Jesse, I'm going to say this one more time. You don't lie on my name. You don't disrespect me. Put your hands up, boss. And uh, right before he did that, uh, I kind of leaned in to Twan and I whispered. I said, Twan, I said, you on probation, man. I was like, this is not worth it. He said, this don't concern you, boss. <laughs> and he was shaking. Like he, he yelled at me so loud. He was shaking. He said, this don't concern you, boss. <laughs> I can hear and his then, distinct voice. Yeah, I can yeah, hear it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I really thought that this was kind of low, but I guess I could understand where Twan was coming from. Jesse kept refusing to fight him, so he spit on Jesse. Oof. And then Jesse put the fist up, and Twan got so hyped. He was like, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, boss. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, it, it was almost like he was proud of Jesse. Right. <laughs> because because that's he was trying to bait him into fighting. Right. But, but you don't spit on a man so just the very fact that jesse put his his fist up you know just i mean jesse's a big dude so you know right. twan ain't no big dude yeah he's skinny but but i think that maybe twan took what i whispered to him in his ear at that moment and just said don't you ever uh what did he say don't you ever accuse me of uh stealing something from this studio I've been in bathrooms better than, than this studio. Like, are you kidding me? He said, I, I've been in, he said, I had bathrooms at hotels that's better than this studio. And then he kind of spit at the ground, you know, and that's a universal sign to say right. I'm disgusted. But, uh, but, but between me and you, I really think that if, if Twan really wanted to, he could have took it there. 
but something inside of me feels like he still respected Jesse enough. Just, I'm gonna let him know that I'm angry, but I'm not gonna actually harm him. Because because if he really wanted to harm him, I, I don't think he would have listened to me. I don't think he would have baited him by spitting. It would have been none of that. He just would have harmed him. So probably a mistake on his part, but deep down i still think that that showed a level of respect that he didn't actually go there with you know mm -hmm. and and to his credit i still respect jesse to the point okay you can say what you're gonna say you can do what you're gonna do but you're not gonna spin on me. right because because yeah he was ready to thump then and then i would have been in the situation because you know something would have had to give mm -hmm. you know right because because i know both of these cats and I wouldn't be trying to see it end in a homicide either way. So at some point I would have had to get in, involved and I really wasn't trying to do that either. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've, we've talked about a bunch of different names. Um, you've got to work with a lot of, you know, different artists. Who are your yeah. one or two favorite people to collab with? I had the honor of uh, working with Chuck D from uh, Public Enemy. Mm -hmm. And then I work with uh, Fiend from uh, No Limit Records. Right. So um, Fiend was a lot less personal. It was, uh, I had a, a mutual friend in the industry. I told him he was real close with Big Gip and Fiend. And okay. I said, Which, whichever one reaches, reaches back out to you first, I got this money for him. Yeah, so, so, so Fiend was kind of complaining that his verse didn't sound the way it sounded the way he sent it to me but then part of me just felt like hey i paid you for the verse like you don't get to critique it like right. it's, it's mine now you know <laughs> but it wasn't people's favorite because some people said that they felt that he didn't have that much energy in his verse and i said well i can't control that you know mm -hmm. uh he was somebody i always respected and then with Chuck D, with uh, getting him on a project, it was really me just actually meeting with him and spending, what well, I think I spent about four or five hours with him in Racine. Mm -hmm. And then I just asked him if I could just, just use part of the conversation we had and turn it into like a little interlude. And um, he used to email me from time to time after that and uh, he would always call me Racine. He would forget that I was from Milwaukee. Cause I don't know if you remember this, but I also used to write for a magazine in Chicago. So yes. at the same time that I was rapping, I was actually doing hip hop journalism mm -hmm. for a magazine called The Pub Report. But in terms of non collaboration, in terms of national cats that I actually put on my project, you will probably I'm going to call it fanboy. You're probably going to fanboy out on this because you would probably say, I would imagine these guys being this cool. Mm -hmm. The coolest cats that I ever met from the industry was the alcoholics. Next, next week I have Tash booked. <laughs> He's my first big interview next week. Yep. Dude. I fucking love the licks. Oh man. Hey, hey, when I tell you, I was on the tour bus with them when they performed at the rave. I was at the mm -hmm. tour bus with them. And then they were staying at the Ambassador uh, Hotel across right. the street from the rave. And I was kicking it uh, in the hotel with them. And uh, they just silly dudes. They cool dudes. And the biggest thing I got out of that interview that I did with them is uh, j Ro told me that they got so much love in Switzerland, when they were performing in Switzerland, mm -hmm. that that ninja, that Negro moved to Switzerland, and I think he told me he lived there for seven years. j Ro did? He lived in Switzerland for seven years. Damn, I didn't know that. Yeah, because, because, because as you already know, and this is something else that I'll get into before our time is up, Europe loves hip hop more than America loves hip hop. Easily, yeah. So so what can happen is Big Daddy Kane, Master Ace, The Licks, they can all tour over there and it's like they're just as big as Drake. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and I guess I'll just piggyback and say that if I could have figured out a way to monetize it, Capital Drive was extremely popular in Germany, France, Australia, and England. And uh, I, I want to say I even sold some copies in Japan. But for whatever reason, Capital Drive was cracking overseas. And I would always get uh, royalty checks from CD Baby mm -hmm. ab about people in Russia and Australia and England buying my album. And I probably could have done like J-Ro and moved over there for a couple of years and probably just toured off of just that album mm -hmm. without even putting out a follow-up or a second album. So I still to this day don't understand how that works or why that is. But if I could have figured out a way to get over there, yeah, me and Fat Daddy Boo would have made some money. I remember the first time this was the first rearranged project and I, we saw that we had sales in Poland and that's just blowing my mind that someone in Poland would care what, you know, two guys from the Midwest were talking about. But they're yeah. real hip hop heads over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could have a, you would really have a competition to even say which country in, in Europe is the most into it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's probably like a six-way tie between Norway, Ireland, Poland, Germany, Italy, and, and like France. Right. <laughs> it's probably like a six-way tie of how deep they they go into the culture. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, they know more about the forefathers, you know, the beginnings and kids in the US, like you said, do. Yeah. It's almost sad. So I'll slide into some of my basic hip hop questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could only listen to one MC's catalog for the rest of your life, who would that be? The the more and more I think about it, it's probably cannabis. Wow. Well, well, and, and this is why I say this, because uh it's, it's probably one and one A. It'll probably be cannabis or immortal technique. I feel like as, as, as human, yeah, as, as human beings, it's cool to be entertained, but I think when you listen to people that really say deep stuff, I think that it, it sparks your brain cells. Mm -hmm. And when something can spark your brain cells, it's helping you to improve as a human being. So while Drake is entertaining, and who else is entertaining? Drake and I'll even say Big Daddy Kane is entertaining. The stuff that Immortal Technique and Cannabis spit is mind blowing. Um, the greatest discoveries uh, since Arithius uh, Parenthes. Like, like he'll say something like that and then you have to go on Google, <laughs> go to the dictionary, right. and then you'll go down a rabbit hole just figuring out what cannabis just said in a rhyme. Mm -hmm. You know, so people can call it nerd hip hop if they want to, but I just kind of feel like if you're trying to improve as a human being, anybody that will make you go to the dictionary or how about this this is something even better i would probably put krs1 as my third it'll probably be cannabis immortal technique and krs1 because the reason that i don't eat beef anymore i stopped eating beef in high school and that song night, on edutainment yep called beef yep. what a relief when will this poisonous product cease? This is another public service announcement. You can believe it or you can doubt it. Let us begin now with the cow, the way it gets to your plate and how. The cow doesn't grow fast enough for man, so through his greed, he makes a faster plan. Like, come on, man, I'm, I'm 44 and I can still recite that verse. Right. But I listened to it as a 13-year-old freshman and I stopped eating beef. To this day, it's probably 
you know, I, I stopped eating pork on my own, but giving up beef was a lot harder to do. But listening to that song and then doing more research on how beef clogs up your arteries mm -hmm. and kind of leads to heart attacks and stuff like that. I mean, nobody else is rapping like that. Nobody else is giving you something that will change the way that you live your life, you know? Yeah, he earned the term, the teacher. I mean, he embodies oh, yeah. it. So if you were on a desert island and you could only bring five albums with you, what are them five albums? Cannabis has one called Melatonin Magic. And it's very, very underrated. Uh, Professor Griff helped him record that. Because uh, Professor Griff lives here in Atlanta too. So um, Melatonin Magic is incredible. I would probably say... Uh, Immortal Technique has an album called The Third World. That's a good album. Yeah. Yep, like a mixtape album. Um, I think Blacks, uh, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back mm. is the greatest, it's probably the greatest rap album of all time, possibly. So, okay, so that's three. I'm going to probably say Dog Food because it's just something about that album. You know, it came out like my freshman year of college. Mm -hmm. Like Dog Food is just like an album that I just never get tired of listening to. And I just feel like it just has a a tremendous, a tremendous synergy of just like a, a co-producer in Daz and then just a West Coast MC spitting some of the most amazing rhymes you ever heard. And then, okay, I can't get this wrong. Let me... Let me think of one more. And then my fifth one would probably be an album called Powder by Baby Drew and Derrick yeah. No, a.k.a. Didn't AKA, he remake AKA, the AKA, Ice T Power? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember that, yeah. Yeah, be, because I was very proud of that album because when I tell you that that was probably the most popular local album in the history of Milwaukee, like, like, I'm not exaggerating even a little bit. Like, that is by far uh, only only cat that has an album that's probably as popular as the DRE. Uh, right. He has two projects that are probably as popular as that. One album called In Milwaukee and his first album called Deep on a Solo Creek. But for the most part, Powder is the most popular local album ever. And the fact that I went to high school with Drew and used to listen to the songs he had in high school and to see, you know, them put out a project that was so popular and was so good. I mean, it had Be Legit on it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, th those would probably be my five. All right, if you got an extra 10 minutes, I'll do a couple, uh, name an MC, tell me what you think. Yeah, let's do it. We're going to start with Slang Hughes. Um, the one thing that tripped me out about Slang Hughes is that he would be bouncing his head in the booth, like, like really hard. Like he would be like bouncing his shoulders and head, right. but the delivery would still come out calm. And so his, his delivery wasn't matching his body actions. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't, I just could never figure out, uh, how in the world his delivery would be smooth when he was um, bouncing around like that. I'll say this too. Now, this is going to be crazy. This is going to be controversial. But what was the name of the album and the song when y'all sampled? Uh, uh, was it uh, Welcome to the Terror Dome? It was the yeah, opening that song. It was yeah, the that opening was the song. Third, the third album, the FAM Volume 3, the, uh, the dedication. So was that rearranged? Yeah, that was a rearranged. That was the third rearranged album, yeah. Go back and listen to Slang's lyrics. I think he might have took a shot at me on that song. For real? Nah. Uh, uh, man, I'm... Hey, and th this would be so funny if he, if he listens to this... <laughs> And, and you go ask him to decipher the lyrics, but he he was heated about something. 
So he might end up telling me either, yeah, I was a little heated at you Mm -hmm. or it was something else. But it's just weird because uh, I remember when you sent me the CD and it was the first song on the album. Right. And and Joe Button does this all the time, too, because Joe Button always thinks that Drake is always taking a shot of him on on every song he puts out. I just remember things like, is Slang taking a shot at me on this? So it'd be it'd be funny to find out from you. Yeah, if, I'm, if, I'm if, interested if, now. If, yeah, if he goes back and listens to what it was, but um, very very humble dude, right? Uh, very very underrated MC. If the only thing that I was mad at him about was changing his name from Slangston Hughes, the the whole thing mm-hmm. because nobody had ever taken Langston Hughes and turned it into a stage name. And um, right. my major in college was uh, public relations, but my minor is black history. Okay. So yeah, I thought that was tremendous that he did that. How about Curtis Blow? Curtis Blow, we all, we all owe him some money, man. Um, <laughs> Curtis Blow and, um, and Run DMC, Nobody would ever care about you releasing local albums in Manitowoc and Sheboygan right. or me releasing albums in Milwaukee. Like nobody would even fathom supporting us if they did not make rap mainstream and palpable and inaccessible. So he's somebody else that doesn't get the credit that he really deserves, but we owe all we all owe a lot to Curtis Blow. I agree 100 percent He's not brought up enough. No, no. How about Master Ace? Big Daddy Kane said he used to call him glasses because when he came to the studio to rap with them, he wore glasses. Mm-hmm. And I think I think he was still in college. I think he was still in his senior year of college when uh he recorded the symphony. Mm-hmm. And I think He's one of my all-time favorite MCs. Uh, Eminem said that Eminem said that Redman is the best MC of all time, and he's always contended that Master Ace was his favorite MC. Mm-hmm. And I think just the very fact that he signed Strick from Milwaukee uh, to be a part of right. his group, EMC. EMC, yeah, that was a dope I album. Think- that first one, yeah. Yeah, I think that 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 gives even more uh, credence to the fact that of why I would love Master A so much. He would be the one to sign somebody from Milwaukee who was mm-hmm. underrated and hadn't been heard. And um, uh, his first album, uh, "Take a Look Around," is one of my favorites. He he probably has one of my favorite catalogs in terms of somebody that almost every single album that they ever put put out I liked mm-hmm. or I should say I, I own I just recently stopped buying Master Ace albums after the Long Hot Summer because okay. Long Hot Summer was supposed to be his last album and then he kept making albums but mm-hmm. everything up to uh, Long Hot Summer I owned every album that he came out with and all of his albums were good to me you probably feel the same way. I love Master Ace. He he's another one doesn't get mentioned enough. Right. All right. Don't be afraid to diss this next artist. Yeah, Kane. Yeah. You talking about um Yeah, Kane, my Kane, 101st Airborne Kane. I I, I only dissed him that time for, for shock value because <laughs> yeah, when we when we when we did that song, it was a it was a real tight song. I can't even remember the name of it. Yeah, I remember what you're talking about. I can't remember the name either. Yeah, well, well, me and Boo had the 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 craziest line because Boo said, "It's the return of the crackers and the Negroes." Yeah, he said, yeah. Oh, what song was that? <laughs> no, it, that it, is it, that was from was the gonna, f- the fast forward. Fast yeah, forward. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I can't remember the name of the song, but that was going to be our opening song. And I just thought it was so funny that Boo said it's the return of the crackers and the, and the Negroes, except he used the real word. Right. And then um, I said, uh, uh, I reached out, uh, I, I called uh, MC Kane and he ain't called me back. So right. I'm going to go ahead and fight him when we finish this track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he, and he actually thought that I meant it, but I was just being funny. Right. But um, I always liked Kane. Um, 
he he featured me on the song uh kick it in the hot spot yeah with uh with uh my boy del ray from emerge aka mm-hmm. david and um i always i always liked the fact that even though he claimed wisconsin him telling me that he actually was raised in florida right uh I could I could kind of tell because he always had a little bit something different to his delivery and, and the way he spit things. Um, yeah, so yeah, I always like Kane. How about Black Sheep? I really didn't like anything past their first album. Is that is that the one with uh, Wolf and Sheep's Black Clothing? Sheep? Yeah, choice yeah, is who's yours. The, black, the choice is yours. Yeah, but but black sheep never really never really did it for me. What about MC Breed? MC Breed is definitely one of our most underrated MCs of all time. I totally and agree. What 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 just just think about it from this perspective. Drake is a fake independent rapper, and right. what I mean, what I mean by he's a fake independent rapper, you remember when "You're the Best I Ever Had" came out? Mm-hmm. He said everybody got a deal, everybody want a deal, or everybody got a deal. I did it without one. Did he not say that on the song forever? Mm-hmm. Dude, he was lying. He was signed to Cash Money, and had a secret deal with Rap a Lot. Rap a Lot. Yep. Yep. So the so really rap a lot discovered him. Jay Prince allowed Baby to put him out as cash money, but he was secretly, he was secretly rap a lot slash cash money. He was signed. He was signed. Right. But right. MC, when MC Breed came out with Ain't No Future in Your Fronting, he never was signed to a major record label. And I'm trying to really think about it, AK. I promise you of the five or six albums that he came out with, I promise you, I don't think he ever signed to a major label. No, I don't and think he, so. It, he was on a label called Itchabon. Itchabon, yeah. yeah. Rap Records. A, dude, Tupac, Spice One, all kind of people would collab with him. Yeah, too short. And he's doing it from Flint, Michigan? I'm like, are right. you serious? And, and the other thing about MC Breed that uh, I remember hearing is that he's one of the best freestylers ever. Is they they say that you could you remember the real the reels that, that we yep. used to record with? They say that if 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 he wanted to, you could like start a real to real, and MC Breed could freestyle until the the real popped or till the real ran out of film. Damn. You know what I'm saying? So. Right. Not not mind blowing freestyle like a cannabis, sure. but can, but consistent, and and to the point that you know he's freestyling and still saying witty stuff. They mm-hmm. say MC Breed could do that for like an hour and twenty minutes. How about Fat Daddy Boo? Fat Daddy Boo did two of the most underrated albums, man. Uh, original Gangster. I love that. Album. I, yep, I think you you gave him one beat for uh, original gangster that could be um, yeah. yeah it was the one that had like a james brown sample right 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 yeah th- that was my favorite song the album and then he did a follow-up album called the boiler maker mm-hmm. which i thought i thought was even better than that and um yeah he just he just has like a real uh cold rhythm when he raps uh uh Dope and dice, guns and, and knives. Ghetto life ain't nothing nice. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? It's like, if you take that, it sounds simple. Uh, guns and knives, dope and dice. Ghetto life ain't nothing nice. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's mind-blowing, but then when you hear him say it in rhythm and right. you see how he matched all those syllables up, it's really cold, you know? You know, uh... Some people say we would like Ghostface and Raekwon because even though Capital Drive is considered a classic, a lot of people don't realize out of the 10 songs, Boo was on five songs. So yeah, he was on half the album, you know? And uh, and I only did one project in my whole career without him on it. 
and that was that Beverly Hills 53209. And I was pretty much at the end of my rope. And I don't know. I, I think with rap, man, I just think, you know, like getting married, buying a house, like this is right. stuff I think that I'm long, long overdue to accomplish, you know, things such such as yourself has done that who has done. I, I remember Slang was engaged at one point, so I don't yeah. know if he ever followed up and got no. married, but but I I think that rap probably stopped me from doing some of those things, but I will say if I ever get to the point when I'm kind of in a better place with that, like finally have a kid, finally get married, get a condo, get a house, I think I might try to reconvince Boo because he wanted to do a Ghetto Centric 3 album. Yeah. And and this is so cold. So since we came up with the semi colon and then subtitle Ghetto Centric 2, this Chitlin Circuit, mm -hmm. this one was gonna be called Ghetto Centric 3 Milwaukee Nights. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna so I'm gonna let you guess what the album cover was if I was gonna call it Milwaukee Nights. Harlem Nights? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and then it fits because Boo like dresses like that anyway. Even when we would do right. shows, sometimes yeah. he would wear suits. So it would just be like one of us would be Eddie and the other person would be Richard Pryor right. and just recreate that. And uh, yeah, I, I think that if he hears this interview, you know, once uh, I kind of achieve some other things because I just feel like, you know, being independent and just chasing your dream with music like I, I put a lot of stuff on hold mm -hmm. and and wasn't focused on certain stuff and you know at 44 if i get to the point where i'm married and have a kid you know i might do one final track lacer uh solo album and then uh pro possibly if he wants to do it one more track and boo and i was thinking about calling uh my album motivational speaker yeah, I mean, my biggest thing with music is that uh, it really helped my appreciation for traveling because I was traveling just to try to sell records. But, you know, I know the city of Indianapolis like the back of my hand now mm -hmm. because because I would go out of town to Indiana selling CDs and Gary and Indianapolis. And I ended up learning Indianapolis like I know Milwaukee, you know, and I would have had no other reason to learn Indianapolis other sure. than I was trying to be an artist and trying to be heard you know mm -hmm. well I, I appreciate you sitting down with me do you have any pluggables to plug where can people get at you um i'll be honest with you man uh i kind of eliminated everything that says track laser to try to like move on from that branding mm -hmm. that was a very that was a very hard thing to do but Right. Mostly everything is J A E S P R O O J Sproul. So uh, I changed my YouTube from Track Lacer to J Sproul, and my kind of moniker is Movies, Music, Sports, and Life. So right. if anybody out there types in J A E S P R O O or types in Movies, Music, Sports, and Life, it's gonna come up and that's pretty much all I talk about on my YouTube. And I also have a writing site where I write about movies and life and sports. And that's pretty much where the transition is because, you know, like I said, at, at being 44, I could probably maybe put out one more really incredible project, but you know, the way that I know, even J. Cole is getting frustrated with rap and is talking about retiring. Mm -hmm. And AKU, the average person doesn't know what that means. You know what that means. If J. Cole is thinking about retiring, it means that artists that speak to the level that I speak and he speak, we just don't feel like it's worth it anymore. It's mm -hmm. harder to get motivated because we're starting to feel like nobody wants to hear intellectual rap. Nobody wants to hear metaphors like it's almost like not a good look to be looked upon as a lyricist anymore right <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, so yeah so it becomes harder to continue to make your art if it's getting more and more to the point that nobody wants to hear 
the people who rep like that. That's the same reason that Andre 3000 Quit, yeah. like hardly rapped anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. A really good story is the song Poppin' Tags. Do you remember Poppin' yeah, Tags? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Poppin' Tags features who? Is Jay-Z featuring Outkast? No, mm -hmm. it's Jay-Z featuring Andre. Big Boy and Killer Mike. Oh, Andre what isn't on that. Right, what mm -hmm. happened, that was supposed to be Andre featuring, I mean, Jay-Z featuring Outkast. Mm -hmm. And Andre did an interview, you know how he talks. Sure. I mean, oh. <laughs> I, tried, I, I tried to write for it, but popping tags, I just couldn't find any motivation to write for it. So I figured, you know, my brother Killer Mike, that might be an opportunity for him. Mm -hmm. That's where somebody, the way that I write and the way J. Cole writes and the way that Andre 3000 writes, that's the situation we find ourselves in is that either you have to dumb it down mm -hmm. and then you get to the point, if I dumb it down, do I even want to rap anymore? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So, so yeah, so that's that's what I'm on. J. Sprue, movies, music, sports, and life. And I can always kind of make my contribution through that. But unless hip hop does a total revolution, uh, then I might throw my hat back in the arena, mm -hmm. but I'll be honest with you. I don't I don't see it happening anytime soon, dude. Nah, unfortunately so, not. Yeah, man. I, I used to think Soldier Boy was whack. Like Soldier Boy <laughs> sound like most deaf compared right. to some of these cats. <laughs> it is that. Yeah. I'm trying to tell you. Sometimes I wonder if I'm just a grumpy old man or if it's really that bad, but no, it's that bad. It's that um, bad. Man. And, and, and then I'll say this, this, this part isn't even funny. What's, what's happening in Chicago is like the biggest curse ever on rap music. The fact that these cats started, and, and I can't even totally blame Chief Keith because Chief Keith, if you really listen to him, used to try to make songs that actually had a chorus. It devolved, not evolved, it devolved from Chief Keith making songs to have a chorus to these young cats in Chicago. It's not even, you can't even call it songs, AK. All they do, all they do is make a song and it's usually two, three minutes long and there's no chorus. And all they doing on there is talking about who they shot mm -hmm. and, and specifically talking about how we smoking on the, the pack, AK, the dead body. Mm -hmm of the person from your street or your gang that we shot. And they call that drill music. And then Brooklyn and the Bronx felt like we got to copy drill music because we don't want Chicago getting all the credit, air quote, the credit. So now New York hip hop is dead and all New York is doing right now is making drill music, which is a bunch of dudes bragging about how we killed somebody on your side. And then London started making drill music and you don't, and you know, they don't have guns over there. So they right. stab each other. They stab each other. So now all the kids in London is rapping about how they stab each other instead of rapping like a uh, dizzy rascal. And then it's like that everywhere. So it's like a curse. Now, now Milwaukee is trying to do drill music and uh, my homie lost, you know, uh, his godson to that just because he was affiliated with some people that were going back and forth on songs. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it's, it's, it's some of the worst stuff ever was happening because at that point, it's not even art no more. You're not no. an MC. T to me, you're not, even, you're not even a rapper. If the only thing that you're doing is getting on a song and the only thing that you can talk about is that you shot somebody who looks like you, you know, a a as a black man, like I'm, I'm highly offended Right. that 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 this is what they think is cool to do you know and i don't know it's 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 rough it's rough yeah well like i said i appreciate you uh sitting down maybe in the future we'll have to do a part two yeah definitely if, if, if you can think of some more stuff to talk about but uh it's hip-hop yeah, yeah. i could talk all day long about hip-hop uh, yeah 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 most definitely all right man take care peace all right, man, be easy. Could you let me get a dollar? No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. Let me get your trash.
ass fur. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. One of y'all got a square? No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. The recession song, the recession song. Cold hood, hold it down when the pressure's on. It's your boy, you know Lace is the last name. Motion picture flow, credits in the last frame. Nothing moving unless you're trying to get the first place. Smirk face, laying verses on my first take. Sound cocky, what it's really coming down to. Time's money, too expensive for a round two. In 98, we was talking about some bling bling. 2010 is Roman noodles and some ginseng. And tall bottles, if you dating all models, how you supposed to get them down to eat a sandwich at McDonald's? Better drop them for a minute. A cell phone, I'm with it. But don't be talking like you good and never running out your minutes. I admit it, nowadays you put some gas in your ride. Hey, bones for two gallons is a blast of your pride. But we hood, so we always was prepared for a recession. Black people, what you scared for? Could you let me get a dollar? No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. Let me get your transfer. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. One of y'all got a square? No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. The recession song, the recession song. Cold hood, hold it down when the pressure's on. It's kind of funny when you listen to the radio. You think it's free, but to me, we got a way to go. They got a prob, they can't sell what you buying. But you got a bigger prob, you can't work, but you trying. No denying, advertising loses courage like a line. Now they crying and they whining, them execs start firing. Steve Harvey sent home, now it's over, boy. And even worse, we, we don't, don't get, get to hit more soldier, boy. boy. I got a game plan, never been the same man. To play my cards, lose the game, play the same hand. Don't got a car, I'ma get on the bus. Don't got a bus, I got some feet, I'ma tell them it's up. No excuses from my mouth, mill town or dirty south. If you move me to Alaska, I'm a fish instead of pout. But we good, so we always was prepared for a recession. Black people, what you scared for? Could you let me get a dollar? No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. Let me get your transfer. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. One of y'all got a square? No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. The recession song, the recession song. Cold hood, hold it down when the pressure's on. Could you let me get a dollar? No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. Let me get your transfer. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. One of y'all got a square? No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. No, I ain't got it. The recession song, the recession song. Cold hood, hold it down when the pressure's on. Yeah.